morning, everybody, and uh, welcome to the uh, uh, morning session. And I really would like to acknowledge the generosity of the HSRC in bringing us together this morning. Thank you very much, Professor Sudin and Dr. Lude Mahali. Thank you for the opportunity. Thank you also for the Spencer Foundation's funding. Um, this morning, I'm going to be focusing on the uh, missing element in policy implementation. And uh, I've written a lot about policy development in the last uh, 15 to 20 years. Um, those of you who remember uh, Vic Webb, colleagues, uh, that's going back at least, you know, at least to 2007, will remember kind of the, the work that was being done in that kind of heyday, if I could put it like that, of new policy development uh, in higher education. But really, the, um, the last 20 years, I think, have been generally a disappointing harvest if we look at the um, evidence of multilingualism in higher education. And I, I say that with a great sense of humility, because I also chaired the UKZN Language Policy Committee when I was there for about 10 years, which led to the first bilingual language policy in higher education, other than Afrikaans, right? EC Zulu and English, and that was started in 2004, that development. And then moving on to private higher education, St. Augustine's, where I was registrar, and then coming now uh, to Northwest University, where I've been nine years this year, also chairing their language policy committee for the Senate. And Professor Sudin was one of the speakers we had to address the Senate, if I remember, it was the Senate that you came to speak to. Um, a long time ago, in about 2017 or 2018, um, to talk about the importance of language access, epistemology, and so on, um, within the knowledge domains of the curriculum. So I'm going to I'm going to skip briefly over the aspirational dimension of policy making. I think everybody in the room is is probably familiar with uh, these extracts from legislation. Um, in terms of what we were trying to do, I think since about 95, trying to do with language in South Africa in terms of creating learning environments that, you, that were genuinely, genuinely, authentically multilingual. <clears throat> Instead, what we got was this kind of layering over of policy work, policy framing that aspired to be multilingual, but of course the practice um, didn't speak to multilingual practices. So these are six extracts. I can give you the references a little bit later that come from the LEHEP, the LEAP, the you know, frameworks, all sorts of things, constitution, whatever. I'm not going to be looking at that. I've covered it in a lot of my own scholarly work. And as I said, what I'd like to do is really look at what hasn't worked and why it hasn't worked so far. Of course, as um, Elude said earlier and Jackie noted earlier, if you want to interrupt and ask a question, we can do so. Please don't feel that this is a, a lecture in the conventional mode. I'd be happy to take questions as we go. Um, so policy work in South Africa, I want to talk about in another kind of way. Or I don't want to talk about its features. I want to talk about why it hasn't kind of delivered. And there's been a lot of, a lot of uh, scholarly work on policy making. Um, and I've given you a lot of references, you'll see I'm just citing about five references uh, from about 2007 to right up to 2000 and, what's it, 2017 to show that we have no shortage of scholarship uh, in this particular domain in South Africa, but really the studies that we've seen being conducted, the survey work that has been conducted, have generally been small-scale studies, that's the first point, and that suggests to me that our policy framing is generally a fragment fragmented framing in South Africa. In other words, the way we pull together work on policy implementation at a national level is incoherent. That's what I want to say. It's incoherent, it's patchy, it's fragmented. Um, a lot of scholars uh, have pointed to the absence of political will. So since the early 2000s, uh, many of our colleagues in this room have been writing about the absence of political will in supporting uh, policy implementation. So language policy committees are easy to set up, 
uh, easy to, relatively easy to get going, and we think that the work involved in that is fairly productive work, and it's meant to be good work, and then kind of that's where the work tends to fall short. Um, and I think there is a new area of scholarship that we've got to open up in a less glib way. So we talk about policy to implementation at uh, that link, but actually the plan, the plan, the language plan, the vehicle through which the policy comes to be actioned, experienced, felt, seen, heard, is the key element to realization of the aspirational dimensions of policies. And if we look at university language plans over the last 10 to 15 years, uh, my feeling, and again, this is really uh, uh, arising from the reading of the work I've been doing concerning planning particularly, not policy, is that the plans are kind of thin. They're not educationally informed. They're not linguistically informed. And they tend to focus on a kind of a reactive impulse. In other words, because this is perceived to be a kind of transformational issue, university leaderships respond to the impulse to plan around a certain number of events that occur, whether it's fees must fall or and, you know, Black Lives Matter and so on. There is a kind of, well, students have said something, staff have protested, let's do something now. You know? But the longer term view of planning is certainly absent in the work that we've seen in the last 15 years. And that, in a sense, has led to a loss of credibility. I'll just say it in a very straightforward way. When people talk about language policy making these days in South Africa, students and staff kind of eyes glaze over. You know, and if you begin to talk about the need to professionalize the academy, I'll come back to this point later, the men in the room tend to look out of the window. Fortunately, there are no windows here. And the female yeah. academics in the room start fiddling with their curls, and everybody get nervous because you're talking immediately about an issue that's going to affect the autonomy of academics. But I'll come back to this a little bit later on. Um, so I'm also going to take a rather different perspective on where to begin to look at higher education issues, because I suppose you're expecting me to talk about higher education to start with. But actually, I want to talk a little bit about primary schooling and what's going on there, and pick up on some points that Caroline made Yesterday, thank you for making those because it links quite nicely into the issues you raised. And, uh, and, I, and I begin at this point because when I talk to students, and I talk a lot to students about the importance of multilingualism, there is always this question about, well, you know, where do you begin with the plan for multilingualism? Um, and is higher education the right place to begin? Shouldn't they be doing this? You know, students typically say, shouldn't you be doing this in primary schools? So what I want to say is that what we see in South Africa in terms of the, of the work that's being done on primary education, it's to my mind not accidental that there's a resurgence of scholarship on literacy in primary schooling. Um, and I think that resurgence of interest on the scholarship of literacy in primary schooling is in recognition, is in response to the deep concerns that academics have about the functional literacy of their students in higher education. Now, these are not separate. These are linked. That uh, the need for bridging courses, for academic literacy courses, how many of you have worked in those kind of environments, literacy environments? Just put up your hands. I'd like to see. Good, good many of you started your careers there. Um, the concerns that are raised there at a, at a kind of um, after-the-fact level um, have their origins in primary schooling. And we've got a lot of really good research that's been generated by RESET and others. The HSRC has been involved about the, the, the nature of our um, primary schooling education. And uh, we are now able, if we do meta-analyses, which is what has been done, these, these references that I've been providing here are all meta-studies of one kind or another. Um, we're linking now the literacy issues that affect throughput, uh, retention, success, etc., in higher education. We're linking those in a more structured way, in a more careful way, to what's going on in primary education, in the ECE foundation phase, grade, or etc. And we can see that uh, most of this research, uh, which is uh, focused on academic achievement in higher education, most of it points to 
um, problems in the schooling environment with the way language is a planned for, school language policies, how language is taught, um, how it's assessed, and the big discrepancy between school language policy framing, so the language and education policy, right, the schooling policy, and what teachers are actually doing in schools, the gap between those two areas. So I'm not coming at this um, plan issue from merely the perspective of, you know, what we really need in higher ed is a better plan. Actually, what we need is a better perspective on planning for language right through the system. Um, and I think the, the, you know, some of the work that's being done in these areas, I think particularly of Nick Spall's work, um, Nolene Turner's work, um, <clears throat> and others, and the uh, Rosemary Cromartie and I did a survey of um, an in-country focus article of all the research that's been done in primary education uh, language-related work. The focus of that work tends to be on literacy impoverishment in the school. I want to call it literacy impoverishment in the school, and not only in relation to African languages, I might add, or in relation to English and Afrikaans education as well. English language as medium of instruction, similarly for Afrikaans. So I call this how to produce a crisis, because I think the crisis we have is a, is a kind of perfect storm. Um, could use that metaphor. It's a structural crisis. It's one that we have made. And it's one that we have made through our um, sins of omission, as they say, rather than the sins of commission. If any of you are Catholic, you'll know these are the niceties in the distinctions between different kinds of sinfulness. But by not doing certain things, we have produced certain consequences. Um, and what we see in our schooling system is that children routinely read at ages that are way below the grade at which they're meant to be reading, and I'm happy to show you more references. That's why I provided these for you so you can see where I'm drawing my claims from. Um, that the transition to English is problematic, all right? It's uh, motivated well in policy documents, but it's a problematic transition because it makes a series of assumptions that are kind of cannot be borne out, and there seems to be a, a uh, on the other hand, a consensus in the research that while we all accept that home language literacy is a critical foundation for the acquisition of the target language, in South Africa we have a vast portion of our population, parents I'm talking about, who are not literate themselves. So this notion of home language literacy is also problematic notion. So um, these are three uh, points that I wanted to share with you about how we get to the crisis that we have in schooling, right, in schooling, before I'm touching on the higher education side of things. Um, and I can, I, uh, yes, so let's, let's leave that at that. You can see as we go along where, where the thinking is coming from. And part of what happens in that crisis uh, is around what doesn't happen, if I could put it in those terms. And I phrase it in this way, what is not taught in early years isn't learned in later years. Um, and what I mean by this is that when we look at studies about teacher training, with the various iterations of our curriculum, OBE, CAPS, etc., et there were more than just two, about five iterations, um, the teacher training and um, teacher development focused on really policy framing that was genuinely inclusive, participatory, collaborative, cooperative learning, all those kind of great features of OBE, you'll remember problem-based learning, project-based learning, but the practice by our teachers uh, was anything but that. It was behaviorist, it was instructional, it was still rote learning, etc. So the gaps, when we talk about gaps, between policy and plans, we are talking about gaps that are throughout the education system in South Africa. They're not just simply the domain of higher education institutions, these gaps. We own the gaps collectively, together, as teachers, as academics, we own them. Uh, and um, they are based, those gaps, on an uh, unnuanced, unsophisticated 
understanding of what the research tells us about the nature of literacy learning in multilingual environments. That so monolingual models, whether drawn from the West or from elsewhere, monolingual models for acquisition are not appropriate in multilingual environments. And monolingual teaching is not appropriate in a multilingual classroom. But while we might all agree and vote together that this is a, a absolute in our lives, we understand it perfectly, our system is not actually geared to producing the teachers that can facilitate, let alone develop proficiency. So I'm not even getting into the scholarship about proficiency at Google this morning from an IsiZulu perspective, just thinking about you now. I'm not talking about language proficiency in the teaching of literature in IsiZulu, Isitosa. I'm talking about just the skill to facilitate multilingual understanding in multilingual environments. Pedagogic skill, not a linguistic skill. We don't even have that in place yet. Um, and we have a wealth of research colleagues, and I know the research is kind of also small scale, so this is my second major point of the talk. Um, in addition to the policy work research that's been done in higher education, the research that's been done in primary and secondary education is similarly fragmented, incoherent, small scale. Uh, studies. And what is really needed is a consistent, consistent engagement, a meta-analysis of many small-scale studies at many different levels of the education sector. We don't have it. You've got to pull little bits from little parts in the country to form that picture. It's really not, not adequate from a planning, a linguistic planning perspective. So what are, the, what are the major findings, if I could put it, in, in all that literature about school dysfunction, um, about uh, 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 inadequate acquisition of vocab, about the in, uh, unpreparedness of teachers in the system for our schools, what are the major kind of findings that emerge that are important from a language planning perspective? And one of those is that um, this systematic teaching of reading does not, in fact, happen in schools. Um, so although we have a highly prescriptive policy, CAPS, right? CAPS is highly prescriptive, uh, replete with a range of teaching materials. I remember when CAPS came out, the promotion, promotional buzz around CAPS was that it was teacher-proof. I mean, what a terrible thing to say about a profession. You know, you have to inoculate, you have to inoculate your materials against the very practitioners who've got to implement them. Although we said um, this should happen, um, even studies post CAPS implementation show that we're still in the same problematic phase we were in with OBE. Still. Um, and despite the provision of materials, and people often say, you know, oh, the problem with the, uh, multilingualism is the absence of resources. The absence of resources. But, but actually, the primary resource is the teacher. And uh, if the teacher is not present as a resource in an activated way, in a sufficiently multilingually nuanced way in the teaching of reading, no amount of books and readers is going to enable uh, scaffolding to take place in an authentic way. So scaffolding being the, the transition between uh, home language to a target language. It's not going to happen. Um, and the, the uh, other issue, of course, is around the, is around the uh, translanguaging. So translanguaging, we shifted in linguistics from code switching, you know, languages as bounded systems, and uh, there was a pro-code switching scholarship and an anti-code switching scholarship. Now we've moved into the kind of happy synergy of translanguaging and students, you know, now what we're saying is legitimate for children to use the many languages they use in the classroom and they'll kind of just kind of mosey along and it'll all happen by osmosis and the teacher must be generally encouraging of this development, call it translanguaging. But in fact, the scholarship concerning translanguaging is still out for debate, really. And uh, we don't have a substantive body of scholarship in South Africa. Again, we have a few small-scale studies that are seemingly, seemingly quite positive about how this could be approached in the environment of 
classroom, but we don't have a we don't have a national initiative that's putting resources into the researching of translanguaging for African languages. Makalela's study, the, the Ubuntu translanguaging study, I think is probably one of a handful. In fact, you know, you need three fingers rather than five on a hand to count what's going on. And I think that's really important because a little bit later, um, and I want to talk about this particularly in relation to the third point. A little bit later, we're going to see why it's so incredibly important that that nuanced, that nuanced research about African language orthographies, etc., uh, is really, really important work from an educational perspective. That language pedagogy is also not a generic thing. Multilingual pedagogies have to be constructed in relation to how languages are structured and that means your teaching profession and guess what your higher education system behind it has similarly got to be more nuanced than it is when it comes to teacher training teacher development um, so you know people talk about caps as being available in all the languages of South Africa but I'm sure many of you know that CAPS was version. Does anybody know this? It was translated, or you know, kind of translation. In other words, there was no thinking about what this would mean, what African languages in the classroom would mean from a resourcing perspective, other than simply the provision of the translated text. And it's really not adequate. It's in fact a non-starter. It's a non-starter. Um, and uh, this thing about uh, caps being version from English into African languages, to my mind, is a kind of travesty. It's an educational travesty, and the department is not alone in shouldering the blame for that travesty because the people who design caps, people in this room, I, I was, you know, consulted about caps. I remember being uh, asked, you know, about what we thought caps could do. So. In higher education, the expertise hasn't been there, I can fairly recently in any event, even though the curriculum making has been happening for like two decades, right? But we don't have the expertise in higher education. I'll come back to why we don't have it in a minute. And then I'm going to come back to the whole point about the plan. Um, so what can we say about the nature of language planning in South Africa as opposed to policy development? So if we look at, at the, the major studies, the, um, the, the um, Taylor, <coughs> Taylor study on national school effectiveness, um, we can see that the subject content of teachers, I mean this was a, a huge study that was conducted, is really low. That the low subject content knowledge of teachers is, uh, bears relation to their own literacy levels. Right? Teachers' own literacy levels. Uh, is a factor in determining how successful teachers are in dealing with content in the curriculum. Um, and universities are directly responsible. I think 20 years later we can see now that we can say it with confidence that the teachers in the system who were pre-1994 are probably uh, less than half than the new teachers coming into the system post-1994. And I know it because when I was dean, we were delivering, you know, about 6,000 teachers a year, if I remember correctly, and that was about 10, you know, about six, seven years ago, right? So teachers in the system, a substantive number of teachers on our post-94 products. So we can't blame this on a kind of pre, uh, you know, a post, uh, a pre, a uh, kind of apartheid kind of dispensation. It's not that easy anymore to do that. Um, and the quality of teacher training um, in, in relation to multilingualism, particularly, is really weak. So the Taylor study and the subsequent studies that have been done on teacher training, I'll talk about the ITERP study a little bit later, <clears throat> these studies show us that the amount of time devoted in the curriculum to the teaching of reading in English is too little, let alone the, trans the teaching of reading in the mother tongue, the so-called early years reading, is too little. Um, and that the graduates coming out of our teacher education programs are not able to teach reading in the foundation phase. 
So the planning dimension, colleagues, I hope you'll share that understanding with me. The planning dimension emerges more and more as being the kind of fault line that, that accounts for the lack of delivery in terms of research responsive planning at universities for teacher education and not just teacher education, research responsive planning for multilingualism in general because we know that most of our teachers are not only BA graduates, they are, you know, they have PGCEs and they come from the mainstream degrees where literacy teaching doesn't happen beyond the first year of a curriculum. Um, and I think the, um, the, the, the content area, literacy development in the content area, do you remember in the 1980s we used to talk about language across the curriculum? Remember this? Anybody old enough to remember the English across the curriculum fad that was associated with communicative language teaching? We used to talk about this, but this particular dimension in multilingual environments has re-emerged as being critical that we need to refocus not simply on the provision of literacy courses in the first year of the school to transition year in higher education. We have now also to focus on literacy development throughout the undergraduate degree. And when I was at UKZN, we did an NRF funded project in those days on benchmarking the British Council tests, the, both those banded tests with our first year students and our honours students. And we found that the honours students experienced as much literacy challenges in different ways as first year students. So the assumption that you can fix something, as we all know, in 12 weeks or a year of first year studies is also a deeply flawed assumption. And if we think that then a graduate is going to be able to pop out of the institution, go into the school and be able to teach a child to transition between uh, Isikosa home language literacy, which hasn't yet been developed mostly in the classroom in any event, to English as a target language in which that student has also not been fully developed either, then I think we have a real recipe for a, I could use a really bad word for this, but I mean, I won't, I mean, we have a recipe for this perfect store, as I put it. <clears throat> so, um, my next point is around the role of planning to develop an aligned, aligned um, pedagogic practice. Um, yeah, I, I'm not going to go through all of these points, but I think if you wanted to understand where the tensions are emerging in the research, it's really in that relationship between pedagogy and content. Pedagogy and content, mediating content, the provision of content, the design of content for the school curriculum, and the pedagogic skills necessary to un unravel content, uh, demystify content, make it accessible. That the models we've been using for teacher training in the schools haven't really worked. Um, and Dampier, I think, really defines this in very clear and clever ways, says that what we are missing is a defined theory for how language is acquired in the primary school, right, in a multilingual environment. And most of us who come from a linguistics background would have grown up on acquisition theories that are not African acquisition theories. They are almost all monolingual acquisition theories developed along the kind of Berlitz model. Everybody familiar with the kind of Berlitz model? Yeah? Where you can, new, you can learn a new language if you're just taught through a new language, that kind of language school model. Um, so here we go. This is a summing up. At this point in the talk, I just want to sum up the kind of four points. Um, in teaching our quality, uh, excuse me, our policy framing, assumes that there is already in place a pedagogic framing for teacher education that is aligned, it's appropriate, and when I say appropriate, I mean appropriate for the languages in the classroom environment, it's relevant and it's contextualized to multilingual environments, multicultural environments. Now I think we've got the kind of multiculturalism right in our schools, because uh, the children are themselves multicultural, but what we don't have are aligned multilingual pedagogies that speak to multicultural audiences in teaching terms. Then for learning, because this is the other side of it, if we look at our policy framing from primary education right through to higher education, we see that in primary schooling, 
um, language education is assumed in our policies to be relevant, contextualized, and appropriate for um, literacy development to happen. But CAPS, and the studies on CAPS have shown that that is not, in fact, true. That the assumptions we've made have not been borne out, whether it's OBE or CAPS or, you know, hasn't happened that way. Um, and then, again, in terms of learning for primary education, we are assuming that whatever foundations are being laid in primary education, that they are adequate, colleagues, that those foundations are adequate for home language development. Huh? That we are contributing in the schools to home language literacy in the primary school. The policy assumes that that is happening, that teachers are doing it. Um, and that the exposure that children get in multilingual primary schools is an adequate exposure to language. And it's not true. The research does not support the assumption that the policy is making. The research doesn't support it. And then finally, coming back to teaching again, so these four points, teaching, learning, learning, teaching, that higher education then takes together those three previous assumptions and in its policy formulation assumes that that has also all happened in primary schools, but it hasn't happened. And this is why I, I want to come back to the the policy to implementation link. Because if I look at all the research that we have in the last 10 years, 15 years or so, we talk a lot about policy terms. We talk a lot about what should be happening in practice terms. But the practice isn't linked to much that is substantively supported through our research about language acquisition for multilingualism number one. And the practice is not supported by the research around multilingual pedagogies, number two, and that our assumptions regarding the home to school transition, ECCE, grade R, etc., are wrong assumptions. And then when we get to higher education, we assume blithely that those foundations have all been put in place. Uh, so the house is rarely built, in my view, I know it's maybe a very critical thing to say, but we have a house that is built on sand. Now, not informed by education research from a language education perspective, not informed by linguistic research from an acquisition perspective, not culturally appropriate for the age appropriacy, and not relevant uh, to the classroom environment, except maybe in our most privileged settings. Let me also just say that as a caveat. <coughs> And maybe I should just pause here, because it's kind of halfway. Are there any questions about this? Yes, take one one question um, about this. This is for the two of these slides of the presentations. I uh, in fact uh, concur with most of the issues that you raised during your presentation. However, my concern is mainly on the lack of the training of teachers in Latin one. Pedagogy. Now, why is this the case? That is number one. Two, what are the challenges in your view? Number three, how then to, to overcome, to have potentially overcome these challenges? Uh, hmm. Yeah, that's my submission. Thank you. Okay. Thank you. Thank you very much. So we we'll just take one more question because I don't want to interrupt the flow too much. Yes. I just want to make a comment. Um, I used to be a little simple teacher. Um, and in my experience, in terms of language, media, etc., what I found was that um, the way the system is structured, as you know, is problematic. Um, in terms of the large medium of instruction, etc. So, as much as we um, embrace diversity in terms of um, the laws, uh, my experience tells me that as all the policies that we have 
it was not working yeah. because learners, you are, you can travel, you can relocate. So as much as we decide what would be the long of the school. So for example, um, let's say that I come from Chibenda and my language, my whole language is Chibenda. And the school that I attend from grade one, primary school, we are taught in Chibenda. But now my parents decide to relocate and I'm in grade five. Yeah. And I am now moving to another province where there's no school that teaches in Chibenda. So that learner already starts with a barrier, a language barrier. Needs to catch up with, with that barrier. And the learner struggles to adjust because of a language barrier. And um, but yet the policy is saying that if we look at the education white paper six that it, that tells us that the environment needs to support the learner. How do we provide that support to the learner? What kind of interventions do we need to put in place for that learner? Um, for that learner to actually progress in the system. So it takes a, a while for that learner to actually just catch up with learning the language of teaching at the school that he or she has in place. So I think that if we are not going to be frank about policy um, and just make frank decisions around language, uh, what, what languages are we teaching in the schools, because it really disadvantages the learner in the long run because if you cannot teach with that learner, if that learner is not able to be taught in his mother tongue from grade out, out to grade 12 and then go to a higher education institution yeah. and further study in that language, then it, all, it disadvantages the learner completely. Mm. So I think that there is definitely a need that we need to make those frank decisions around language and not have this complicated, complex discussions about, you know, what can we do, what we can't do, we know what the barriers are. And we can also say that it is a struggle to provide interventions for those barriers. So, Sorry, Rob, can I just interrupt and ask that people say their names and, 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 and where they're from? So, if anyone wants to just repeat your... Your name and your institution? Stefan Bumbi, UK Thank you. Ethnic Orenson, I'm speaking from my personal opinion, but I'm from Parliament. Thanks, Papani and uh, Agnetha, thank you for those. So, it, uh, uh, okay. The facilitation, pedagogic facilitation in a multilingual space is a highly developed skill. And linguists will talk about it. And I remember Lily Hong Wong Fillmore many decades ago started talking about how scaffolding is done in the classroom by effective teachers from one language to another without the teacher having to be a proficient speaker of the language, right? It is possible to be an effective multilingual pedagogic practitioner without being proficient in the language of the learner. And we don't have anywhere in our system a teacher training or higher education. And bear in mind that higher education spaces, as Carolyn was saying yesterday, are monolingual spaces. We don't make provision for the professionalization either of our academics or of our student teachers in those terms that would enable. So I'm addressing both your points about how do we get there? What should we be doing? And it's not just about teacher training, it's in fact about how academic staff, academic staff interact with students in ways that develop literacy in the languages that students bring to the environment and literacy in the languages that we expect them to acquire in the environment. Okay, I'll come back to this a little bit more as we go along. So another controversial statement that I want to make, but I think it really speaks about the levels of frustration I experienced after kind of working in this field for 15 years. We have a kind of a misalignment in the sector. And the misalignment in the sector is a misalignment between pedagogy, between language acquisition principles, and the curriculum. 
it's not just about pedagogy and skills, it's also about the curriculum. The epistemic access issues, I come back to those. And uh, just as we talk about failed states, I think we've also got to talk about English as a failed lingua franca, African languages as failed languages in terms of teaching and learning because of the micro, meso, macro misalignment. <clears throat> So I come back to this issue around political will. So we've got a lot in the scholarly corpus over the last 15 years about the absence of political will at universities to make African languages a reality in the classroom. Absence of political will. And that is a symbolic, it's a symbolic matter. It's a matter that if we don't get that right, if we don't support it nationally, then it has consequences for resourcing as consequences for how curriculums are structured in higher education. It has consequences then on teachers, and it has consequences for what teachers do in classrooms. So the power status link is an incredibly important link in a monolingual environment of our higher education sector, right? That until we, until we do that as policy makers in a conscious way, inscribe it and ascribe it, uh, until we create that status need through our professions, through our assessments, then the language remains kind of peripheral to the curriculum. And if you think about it, language can't be peripheral to a curriculum. Language is the content. Language is the content. So the need for African languages in nursing, in education, in psychology, in law, in all our professions is like an obvious thing. I'm not even going to argue it. But we don't do it. And when I say we don't do it, I mean we are kind of intellectually lazy about it as institutions. Because A, students don't want it. When you ask them, you know, would you like your assessment in Sitswana, they don't want it because English is what we use yeah. anyway. It's what counts, and this, it's not seen as important to have six for assessment purposes. And you've really got to do a lot of intellectual work with students to persuade them that actually six is going to be really useful in nursing for you, because guess what, you're working in a public healthcare system where it's a language that is fundamentally related to three or four other languages, and even if you have Sasutu or you have Sitswana, you have access to at least another four or five languages. And then, then students will say, oh, but you know, it's nice for the future, but not for me, not now. Let me, uh, let me get through in English and the ones coming after can, they can have the African languages. This is what I get from our students when we have these discussions. Um, and then it's not simply, I think we've also got to say to policymakers in higher education, Prem uh, and Naren, colleagues from Parliament, not simply a matter of providing stuff in a translated form. I mean, this is so like mind-bogglingly silly, right, to assume that providing stuff in a translated form is going to be adequate, even a useful beginning. Um, the stuff has got to come with an understanding of how to teach it. And that needs some work from academics. It needs us to get off our thumbs and like do some work around multilingual pedagogy as part of our professional development. Uh, and what it means to translanguage effectively in a classroom. Learn a bit more about something outside of your engineering degree your science degree, your education degree, which has relevance on how effective you are in the classroom as an academic. And um, then finally, um, when we ask ourselves why do teachers struggle to implement new curricula, colleagues from OBE onwards, new curricula, I mean even from the 1980s with CLT days, teachers struggle because they haven't been invested in and the, the entrance for investment are not government departments, OBE training. Remember those dreadful workshops that we used to have to go to? I remember I was a teacher once. It's not that. It's what universities do in the teaching learning practice of the day-to-day, -day, working with the curriculum that develops the understanding. It's not simply an add-on. It's not a, a literacy course that's going to fix it. It's got to be integrated. Um, 
<clears throat> okay, sorry about lots of the texture, but you're probably wondering where I get the information from that I'm using for this talk. So I want to give you some direct examples of why, why understanding some of the basic things about a language has an impact on how you teach the language. Because our approach is to teaching African languages, and I'm not an African language specialist, so I'm not going to speak for people. But what I've read is that our approaches teaching African languages have been kind of Western import approaches. They are Western methodologies, Western pedagogies, and that's not to say they're inappropriate for English or Afrikaans, or it's not to say that they're not relevant, but they cannot be relevant or appropriate for African languages. Uh, and here's a nice, here's an example from the literature and a study about how at the very um, level of sounds or phonics and so on, you don't teach isiposa in the same way when it comes to the consonants, vowels, morphemes, phonemes, etc., that you teach English. So when we're teaching our student teachers literacy in home language in English, the assumption that we make that that's somehow going to be adequate for home language in general is a wrong wrong assumption and it has terrible consequences for children who are trying to develop literacy i'm not talking about communicative competence who are trying to develop text literacy and we're using a methodology a pedagogy that is not appropriate right and this is not a teacher education issue it is a curricular issue in higher education because if we're thinking about making African languages, still 15 years later, let's think about making Sasutu a language of instruction. We are going to have to train academics in a methodology, in a contextual pedagogy that is suited to the language grouping, not suited to English acquisition principles. And that's going to need intellectual work if we're serious about doing it in an informed way. Um, so you're welcome to read that. I won't read it through with you, but it, it does come from very recent research, this, um, where we look particularly at the nuances of African languages, and we look backwards into, you back engineer those into pedagogy, right? If you're teaching your sounds in a different way, then you've got to have a methodology that enables you to teach sounds in a different way than you would teach them in English. Like, come on. Okay, so um, let's talk a little bit about English. Talk about something that I know a bit more about. I don't know enough about African languages as such. But English is also in an unviable position. Uh, there's an article I wrote many years ago where I called it a failed lingua franca. Um, and still the most cited of the articles that I have. I don't know whether that's just an age factor, but nevertheless, um, what happens even in our English uh, medium of instruction environments is that we, because we can't deal with the complexity of developing um, pedagogies, multilingual pedagogies, because we as academics seem to be unable to deal with the complexity of doing that, um, we then stick even more rigidly, it seems to me, to the monolingual position. Okay, so the primary schools can be where all the home language literacy happens, teachers are meant to be doing that, but we will stay as we are, as high ed. We will stay exactly the same. But even in our approach to teaching English in higher education, as literacy, there is a kind of fundamental set of problems that we've got to confront. Um, and the problems become exacerbated when our schools also go the easy route. So they see what universities are doing. So now, you know, when, we, when I interview teachers, they say, well, look, I've got to prepare the child for the exams coming. So I'm going to go send them to a school now, you know, send them to a school where it's English from the get-go. No home language, nothing. They're going to go straight for English or early years English policy in the school level, and that's going to prepare them for, it's going to prepare them better for higher education. So um, there, when I talk about misalignment between practice 
and policy, you can see it happening more and more and more. The, the slide to monolingualism is kind of seeping through our education system right down into the primary schools, irrespective of what policy might say. And even when we do deal with English in higher education, and those of you who come from a literacy background will know it, um, you'll know that the literacy issues in higher education are substantive. The in the Bele report from the CHE, Lorraine, I think it was, it was in the Bele that shared that group, I think, deals with the massive attrition of black students in our higher education system with literacy and poverty being the two substantive issues coming out of that report that, about success rates. So it's not as though what we're doing as academics in higher ed is any better than what primary school teachers are muddling through in the classroom environment. You know, and uh, when I talk to academics about this, this is the pearl fiddling moment and the look out the window moment because, you know, I say to the colleagues in engineering, Actually, you're going to need to you're going to need to develop yourselves to facilitate multilingually effectively in the classroom. You're going to have to do some literacy across the curriculum in English, ladies and gentlemen, to be effective when your assessment happens in the classroom. If what you're aiming to do is to develop English literacy in the higher age, you're going to have to learn a bit more. You know, and traditionally our perspective has been, you know, that's the language teacher's problem. Send them to literacy modules somewhere, you know, foundation modules, the state funds them, etc. They'll get their problems sorted out there. But it's because it's not integrated, you know the arguments well, because it's not integrated, it's not relevant, it doesn't stick. The learning doesn't stick, the professions don't change, the curriculum doesn't change. Okay, um, one other, two other points. Um, <clears throat> to back this up so that you know. So Deacon's uh, uh, meta-analysis of teacher education programs, I'm using a lot of that in this argument. And then Yvonne Reed's work about English in the intermediate phase, particularly looking at how the, how the teacher training happens on the one hand, but it is as applicable when it comes to the training of academics, as applicable. Both these major, major studies involving thousands of students point conclusively to this set of, uh, of conclusions, right? They are agreed in synthesis with each other. It would seem that teachers start their careers, you can just substitute that with academics, academics start their careers with a weak knowledge base. Weak knowledge base. Um, <coughs> I'm approaching the end of the talk now. I think if we look at the work of the last 10 years, if we, can, if we say the last 20 years have been a kind of a weak harvest, a poor harvest for implementation of multilingual programs, we can at least on the positive side say, well, there is enough controvertible, incontrovertible evidence of causality between poor performance in schools, low literacy levels, and poor performance in the higher education sector. We don't have to have a discussion about that anymore. We don't have to talk about it anyway. Um, the immediate implication of that thing is that we need a greater professionalization of teaching. And I'm not talking about teaching in schools only. I want to come back to this. I'm talking about academics as professional teachers in higher education. There has to be a university commitment to professional development of academics for the multilingual environment and for the literacy-rich environment that is a university. Yeah. That your mathematics, academics, need to, do, need to know as much about language acquisition as your linguists do. Yeah. That's a rather deep implication for people. But I think that's the only way we're really going to deal with the literacy issues. Um, and the development of our students uh, concerning text-based reading pedagogies and coaching and training. Colleagues uh, wrote an article some years ago called The Return to Reading. You know, text-based engagement is, to my mind, the only way in which you engage at a very variety of levels with the sentence structure, with the coherence of the text, with the argument, with the line of thinking, etc. 
the only way you engage with it. And it doesn't happen by simply giving the students a long text to read. <laughs> Go and read a book is not going to solve the literacy problem in the curriculum. Um, what it needs are academics to be trained in how to teach reading at higher education level. Terrible to have to say it to academics, by the way. So I apologize in advance for offending people, but I do think it is absolutely necessary because knowing how to read is not the same as knowing how to teach reading in a foreign language or first additional language. And that's the reality of our classroom environment. Um, and then the, the last set of uh, reflections, uh, there are only seven reflections, fortunately, is that um, over the last 20 years, the provision of indigenous languages and education throughout our system has kind of decreased. So more schools are going the straight for English route, or the early years English route. More universities are now monolingual than they were 10 years ago. Yeah, so as Afrikaans has disappeared, there's not been any conscious replacement of anything in its, you know, other than its UKZN, where it's kind of become part of the curriculum in some respects. There's not been any conscious replacement in the curriculum for the disappearance of Afrikaans. Um, African language departments need to be substantively revitalized, supported by the state, and uh, cohered, cohered brought together to do sector-wide research on language pedagogy appropriate for the language groupings. It's such a small finding that has come out of a recent study, but to my mind, it's an absolutely major finding in terms of dealing with the literacy problems we have in the classroom. Um, and then the findings need to be translated into language plans. So I come back to the plan, the importance of, of planning, because Plans, if you look at them, the last 10 years of our language plans have said nothing, colleagues. You're welcome to look at these plans with me. They say nothing about staff development in indigenous languages. And I'm not talking about communication courses. Right? It's good, and that's a good thing, but it's like a very superficial thing. I'm talking about staff development for multilingualism, number one. Staff development for literacy in English, if it is going to be the lot. Literacy in English for engineering is as important for the engineering academics as it is for the students. Staff development. Plans say nothing. Deathly silence about this aspect in our plans. And then the, the um, ongoing need for that, right? So not simply a one-off, but throughout your career as academics. So you know, to move from basic to intermediate to advanced to, what you know, a whole lifetime of learning in terms of multilingual pedagogies, um, African languages, right? communication, not just a first year, six week course. Not gonna be enough. And that brings me to the end. Thank you very much, everybody.